Today we're going to talk about accessibility. When we talk about accessibility of digital products, what we mean is making sure that every person who goes to a certain site can access the same level of information and have as much as possible the same experience, regardless of whether an individual has perhaps mobile impairments, visual impairments, cognitive impairments, or any type of impairment that might affect how they use the web. How can we make accessible digital products? First, we have to be aware of the issue of accessibility and understand that approximately 20% of the population has some sort of impairment. This also includes making sure that no product is released that is not accessible and making accessibility a requirement of all products from the beginning. Secondly, we must employ empathy as we build accessible products. If we're just going through the motions but aren't learning about users with impairments and having a thorough grasp of their context, their expectations, and more, we're ultimately going to fall short. Lastly, it's not enough just to care about making accessible products. We must also know how to take action. Much of the work to make a product accessible falls on the development team by implementing accessible code, such as through the HTML structure and appropriate tagging of elements to make sure they can be understood by assistive software. But all members of the team must have some level of technical skills. For example, product owners must prioritize time in the backlog for developers to code accessible elements and do plenty of QA testing. And designers must make sure that, from a visual and interactive standpoint, they are including the needs of users with impairments. There are two main authorities when it comes to accessibility standards within the United States. W3C, or the World Wide Web Consortium, is an international community that develops open standards to ensure the long-term growth of the web. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, are merely a set of guidelines, as in they are not mandated, but they are seen as some of the best practices of web accessibility. Section 508 is actually an amendment to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This means that companies that have government contracts or that have government employees using their software have to comply with these standards by law. However, most private sector companies are not required by any law to create accessible code. And because of this lack of regulation, that's why empathy is crucial in a software company from the top down. And I mentioned that these are the two governing bodies in the United States, obviously because other countries will not ever be mandated to comply with the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. However, many countries have their own equivalent of this type of regulation, and so you can look into that more and get more details if you wish. You might be surprised to learn that many guidelines, although they are robust and in general are seen as enough to make digital content accessible, they are not updated very often. With the rate at which technology is evolving, you can imagine that there are some new technologies and expectations that are, these guidelines are not meeting. The way each of these organizations has established criteria is a little bit different. For WCAG, they've established four principles that they call POR, and this stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And they also have very objective testing criteria for A, AA, and AAA, with AAA being the most accessible and single A being the least accessible. But as you can see with Section 508, the definition of accessible is pretty subjective. There are companies whose job it is to audit sites to make sure they are meeting Section 508, and this is how companies either pass or fail. If you're interested to learn more about the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, there's a Drunk History episode that covers this topic pretty well. The need for accessibility has, ex has existed long before digital products. Just look at this medicine cabinet of a 90-year-old person. What workarounds do you see? You might notice that there are large boxes that are neatly arranged, perhaps each box containing a specific type of medicine. This user has also created their own custom signs with large handwriting to find what they need. These adaptations show that something is clearly not working for this user with the way these products are packaged. The packaging might be enough for some populations, perhaps someone who is younger or someone who doesn't need to manage as many medications, but if the designs of products are not universally usable by everyone, they are not accessible. We must also hold digital products and services to this standard as well. Several devices exist to help make the web more accessible. 
let's look at some of these assistive devices that help users with impairments use the web. On the top left, you can see some examples of ancillary devices like keyboards and mouse pads that have distinctive features for users with impairments. The next several pictures indicate other devices that allow users to interact with web content without full mobility. The second image in the bottom row depicts screen reading software, which, which reads both visible and invisible web content, such as HTML elements, to users with no or low vision. Next, you'll see the Apple Watch. While not created specifically for populations with impairments, wearable technology is actually seen as very useful for users with low or no hearing, as they are able to use the haptic feedback of these devices to receive alerts and notifications. Finally, the last photo represents a smartphone app called Google Goggles. This app will tell users out loud whatever is in front of the camera. This type of app has clear uses for users with no or low vision and is one of the more productive examples of, machine, of artificial intelligence that we can see today. Let's take a break here to watch a YouTube video that also explores empathy and accessibility. So go ahead and go to YouTube and search for Empathy and Accessibility by Craig Abbott. And after you finish that video, come back to this presentation. Let's talk about some of the key takeaways from Craig's video. First of all, impairments don't disable people. Environments and designs disable people. For example, a person in a wheelchair is not disabled until there is a sidewalk that doesn't have a ramp. Secondly, impairments can be temporary meaning that users may not necessarily have a long time to adjust to their impairment. This means that accessibility features of a site have to be easy to find and readily available. Thirdly, if we want to make sure our products are usable by people with impairments, we have to use ability tests with users with impairments. And last of all, there are plenty of tools out there on the web that people who make products can use to help avoid disabling users. Of course, doing research with users with impairments is important. There are also various simulations such as specialty glasses, browser plugins, and other things that people that make products can use to not only help them gain empathy, but also learn more about users with impairments. And it's not just the most high-tech companies that are obligated to make accessible sites. Take a look at the homepage for Dunkin' Donuts. Clearly not a high-tech company necessarily, yet even they see the need to make their website easier for people with lower vision to use. Notice the toggle on the top left. When that's turned on, the site goes into a high contrast mode. And now of course a high contrast toggle doesn't address every accessibility criteria, but this is a good example of how all companies who have a digital footprint must make sure that everyone is able to access their content. But what if your product doesn't have a toggle like this? Is it still possible to create a product that only has one mode that is both meaningful and easy to use for able users, as well as those with impairments? Let's explore this question further. Red and green are two of the most commonly used colors for digital products. However, look at what red and green look like to users with different types of color blindness. I mean, there's a reason that, that red and green are two of the most commonly used colors on the web. Not only do they carry significant cultural meaning, especially for the Western civilization, but they can also help users quickly identify the intent of the message, not just through cultural meaning, but because they are far enough apart on the color wheel that they do have high contrast for people who do not have some sort of color blindness or other visual impairment. There is a way to use red and green as part of your product's color palette without disabling users with color blindness. The rule of thumb, is to never use color alone to signify a message because as we just saw not everyone is able to see the same colors the same way but as long as other cues such as icons distinct headings and clear written messages accompany the colors then we are not disabling blind users color blindness is just one type of impairment that actually has several severity levels and several subtypes of its own there are many types of impairments that someone might have and even though the majority of people are reported to not have any type of impairment, by solving accessibility issues for extreme users, meaning those who fall on either end to having significant impairments to having zero impairments, we actually solve a lot of problems for those in the middle of the curve, which represents the, the majority of the population. 
And as a quick reminder, let's remember that extreme users may not always be extreme users their whole life. Sometimes people are extreme users, meaning they have a significant impairment that's permanent, but they may also just be temporary or situationally impaired for a short period of time. In fact, solving problems for some extreme users has actually led to some great innovations in some of the most commonly used products by everyone today. The typewriter that we're all familiar with was actually invented by someone who needed to make some changes to help his blind sister use it. But this typewriter ended up being easier to use by other people because of the extra spacing and other considerations that the inventor took for his blind sister. Of course, curb cuts were designed specifically for people in wheelchairs, but people without impairments benefit from them as well. Similarly, automatic door openers were also created for people in wheelchairs, but are useful for lots of people in different situations today. And lastly, captioning was introduced at a conference specifically for the hearing impaired, but is used by lots of people without hearing impairments today, meaning that since these products were invented, they were solving needs for extreme users, but they actually ended up solving needs for users in the middle of the curve as well. When we design for extreme users, we help everyone in between. Look at the contrast on the left. Obviously, one is easier to read and one is harder to read. And although if you have full color vision, you may be able to read the hard to read red text that's on the green button, but it's obviously not as easy to read as something that has high contrast, even if you're not disabled by the low contrasting red and green combination. Similarly with font size, if you're able to read the teeny tiny text underneath that says hard to read, then that text is not disabling you, but of course it's going to be easier for everyone in the middle of the curb as well to read the easy to read bigger font size. There are a couple of plugins you can explore if you would like to know a little bit more about accessibility. Um, this one is called Funkify and it actually simulates different types of visual and other impairments um, by affecting the way your browser looks and behaves. There's also an Axe plugin um, that will audit sites against WCAG criteria. If you're going to be getting into development or if that's an area that interests you, you might like to play around with this type of uh, plugin. Speaking of code, alt tags and other code elements help a lot. I mentioned earlier that making a site or digital product accessible mainly falls on the shoulders of the developers to make sure that this happens because they have to include a lot of specific coding tags and elements in a website to make sure that it's accessible. Those involved in the product and design of digital software, or perhaps technical communicators who must document and troubleshoot software, must be aware of the types of tasks people perform and how challenging they might be on a physical or an intellectual scale. And as we mentioned before, empathy is a required element to making sure the web is universally accessible to all. Because as Scott Cook puts it, you cannot walk in another person's shoes until you take your own shoes off. Thank you for watching this presentation. Please contact your instructor if you have any questions. Thanks.